and we are live. Hey. Hello, Lauren. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and Tim is in the States right now. Welcome to the USA. So this yes. isn't your first time. This, you're, a, you're a veteran here. This is not my first time. No, this is the 23rd state in the US I've visited. So uh, I'm hot. Welcome to the Get South. Yes, yes. I'm going to be going to uh, another few states in the South soon as well. So, Lauren, uh, he has a look. goal to see all 50 by 50, though that's been a little halted. But he's yeah. on COVID, unfortunately, has kind of COVID. screwed that up. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that'll happen, right? But no, South is fun. I'm in, I'm a New York girl, but I did live in South Carolina right outside of Charlotte oh. for a couple of years. So I loved okay. it. Anyway. Uh, as before my lose all color whatsoever on my screen for anybody who who for some reason has managed to miss the whole Lauren Gretman experience who are you and what do you do okay well my name is Lauren Gretman I'm a financial coach um, I'm also a lifestyle TV personality um, I do national television on lifestyle financial topics, um, not like hard finance topics, more like frugal living, fun finance topics. Um, so I'm a regular on the Today Show, Rachel Ray. Uh, I've been on Good Morning America, Dr. Oz. Uh, today, actually, I'm on The mm -hmm. Doctors um, TV show. So if you want to tune into The Doctors, um, I'll be on there talking about your relationship with money. Um, I have a podcast. I have a website, laurengrutman.com. I'm an author. And the most important job is that I'm a single mom of four wonderful children. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I've been teaching um, like lifestyle finance for 12 years online. Um, and when I say lifestyle finance, that's like um, real life finance. You know, I teach budgeting and getting out of debt, but I also teach like meal planning um, and, you know, how to reduce your bills and like, you know, lifestyle stuff that like you know, financial decisions we have to make every day. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what I do uh, for a living. Mm -hmm. One of the things and one of the reasons why I contacted you, Lauren, is you have an, a strong interest in helping women get out of debt. Mm -hmm. Will you tell us what specifically inspired that and why you want to do that? Why yeah. So, years? yeah. So I was in debt. Um, I was I got married really young at 21. And uh, by the age of 26, I was in forty thousand dollars with the debt. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really know how to manage money. I didn't really know how to budget. Uh, I, you know, and so um, I, uh, in about two years, I learned how to get out of debt. I learned um, primarily through a lot of these lifestyle techniques that I use, you know, mm -hmm. meal planning, freezer cooking, <clears throat> getting rid of, um, you know, negotiating your bills down, coming up with systems on how to budget so that I don't like lose my life. You know, a lot of, a lot of financial professionals teach like financial jargon that I didn't understand mm -hmm. um, cuz I hate spreadsheets and I you know I'm not a, a traditional finance person I guess you would say um and so I had a really hard time understanding financial professionals cuz I I felt like I didn't understand their lingo mm -hmm. um and so once I got out of debt I was like you know what? I want to be that person for women who feel like they're not the financial type you know the the like me like that felt like, you know, financial professionals were speaking Greek to them and like budgets make them break out in a cold sweat. <laughs> and, you know, mm -hmm. I wanted to be that like real life. This is how you can get out of debt without being a super financial person. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's how it all got started back in 2008. And so I, you know, got um, training to be a financial coach and, um, you know, I, I really just kind of put my passion into doing that. And through that, um, through that passion, you know, really my, my big passion now has shifted to not only teaching people like how to get out of debt so much as it is, you know, I've really kind of shifted to more lifestyle coaching too of, um, and that's, you know, a lot of what my podcast is about is talking about the hard money conversations that nobody wants to talk about. And that really translates into life as well. You know, let's get real about our struggles. Let's talk about them. Um, and so you'll see like, you know, over the next year, I'm going to be bringing in a lot of other 
you know, ish, you know, lifestyle issues into the podcast, not so much just all financial mm -hmm. because that's really a passion of mine as well. Tell us more about your podcast. Mm -hmm. We want to hear about this. You're yeah. very excited to talk about this. Who do you bring on and what are some of your subjects? I have a feeling this is something I need to tune into. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So the podcast is called the hard money talks show. And, um, it's all about those difficult money conversations that nobody wants to talk about. So some of the topics, um, that I've had on, I actually, um, I've had on a financial therapist who talks about financial trauma as a child, Wow, um, okay. things you went through as your childhood and how that affects your spending. Uh, I have, I've had gambling addicts on who talked about their gambling addictions and how they got, they stopped gambling and then now help other people, um, and how to get your life back on track. I've had uh, a man who went bankrupt and how he got back on track. Um, I have had somebody who went through, um, financial abuse, which is something that is near and dear to my heart. Um, and that's kind of one of the other topics that I'm roping into the podcast a lot more is, um, you know, I went through a domestic violence relationship after I divorced my kid's father. Um, I went, I unfortunately met a narcissist and got into mm. a relationship and, um, that was a very traumatic time of my life. And so narcissistic abuse and, uh, divorce attorneys, I've, I've, I'm having a divorce attorney on, um, I'm having a narcissistic, um, abuse advocate on I'm having, I did one with financial abuse and how to spot red flags and financial abuse. Um, I just had another topic that I cover on the podcast is, um, how to, uh, taboo ways to make an income. Mm. And so last week I just had a lady on who quit corporate America to support herself through her OnlyFans account, mm. um, yeah. which was a very interesting episode because um, that's very big right now. And I wanted to interview somebody who was making a living doing it. So I talk about all of the things that nobody wants to talk about, you mm -hmm. know, why people don't quit their jobs because they're stuck. They're too afraid mm -hmm. people with poverty mentalities that are now rich, but can't spend their money because they're too afraid that they'll lose it all. Mm -hmm. Um, so a, one guy was an alcoholic who slept, you know, who was a homeless alcoholic and now is a financial educator. So, you know, those are the kind of topics that I'm covering the really hard, hard things, um, race, um, religion, abuse, uh, those are the kind of topics I'm talking about. The ones that typically get stuffed under the rug mm. that nobody wants to talk about. Um, and so the show is in season number two and um, season number three, you will start seeing a lot more like lifestyle topics getting roped into it as well um, as not so much just money, but just like hard money talks or just hard talks in general because it seems like people are just like loving those so much. So um, let's wind back a little bit to, let's say, somebody who was in your position mm -hmm. right, several years ago. So they're forty, fifty thousand dollars in debt right now. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the number one thing that they should be doing right at this moment? I mean, presumably you didn't just suddenly overnight change from being that person to who you are now right what would you say is the most important thing for them to to do today or to think about starting to do today that's a tough question if i were to look back at me you know 18 years ago yeah like 17 years ago i'm dating myself but um and and say this is what you should do i to be honest i would tell myself to do two things I would tell myself to get honest with yourself. Number one, you are not good with money. Mm -hmm. Stop pretending. Yeah. And I would tell myself, number two, find a financial therapist. There's not, there's like 50 of them in the country, but they're mm -hmm. out there and they're online. Uh, if you go to my podcast, episode number two um, with Ed Combs, he is a financial therapist. And if you go to his website, you can see like there's a link or you can go to like the Financial Therapy Association. There's also another podcast coming out that I have on season two 
with another financial therapist who does financial, um, he does money Reiki, which I think is pretty cool. And, um, because money isn't just about dollars. It's deeper than that. It's, it's, it's the thoughts that we think about ourselves. It's lack of self-control. It's the way that we, it's selfishness. It's, it's, Mental health. I had a guy on who talked about bipolar spending um, a couple like last month um, and how to tell if you're bipolar or if you're impulse spending. You know, there's a lot that goes into why we go into debt. Mm. I mean, sometimes it's like we went through a divorce, right? And we can't help it. But then there's so many times when we just have other stuff going on. So if I were to look back, so that's the the uh, mental stuff that's going to help you get through the debt. The second thing that I would say is go through and cancel all of your unused things that you're not using mm-hmm. and do a spending review of the past three months. And I teach this. I have, I have a course and I have a community on my website um, called The Financial Renovation. And in this course, I teach people to go through um, the past three months of their spending. And I have them categorize it like groceries, eating out, miscellaneous, clothing, alcohol, um, you know, whatever categories they want to put it in. And then you you add up the three months and then divide it by three. And you're going to find an average of what money, what you've been spending money on. This is almost like weighing yourself before you go on a diet. Mm -hmm. If you do this, you can see, and it's kind of like, this is the aha moment of like, Oh my goodness. I've been spending like, like I've had people do this and and tell me like, I've been spending $3,000 a month on eating out. (laughs) They're like, no wonder I'm, I'm broke. Yeah. No. Or on groceries. Mm -hmm. Um, I had no idea I was spending that much money and this is going to help you get really real with yourself. And then you can start making decisions on that. If you just start making decisions like on a whim, uneducated on where you have been spending your money, you're not going to be successful and you're not going to be able to have that aha moment of like, <gasps> geez, cause you need that. Like, you know, I actually just posted something on Facebook yesterday of like, you need that, when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change Mm -hmm. moment, Mm -hmm. you kind of need that. Like, uh Oh, I need to do something or else I'm always going to be in the same situation. Mm -hmm. And you also need to be willing to make some hard decisions. Like I had to sell my house back then Mm. because I couldn't afford it. Yeah. That's hard. Like I had this house built for me and I, three years later, could not afford it. And I had to like come to that humbling conclusion of this was a bad mistake. Mm. And are we willing to get that real with ourselves and walk away and not care what people think about us and do what's right for us, for our kids and for us that those are the hard decisions. Mm. You know, those are, those are like the gut wrenching decisions. Um, that, you know, I'm actually currently going through one of those, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a financial professional, but I made the hard decision this year that I wanted to put my house up for sale because it's too big for me. You know, I have, I'm I'm divorced and I have four kids. I've owned this house for 12 years. It's 3000 square feet. I'm here half the time without my kids. And I had to make this tough decision of like, I'm putting all of this money into the house to be here by myself half the time. It's just too much money. Yeah. You know, I'm putting too much money into this house. So I'm downsizing to a smaller house. That is a hard decision. Mm. What are people going to think of me? My kids are sad. My kids are so sad. I'm doing, you know, and, and I've hemmed and hawed for about a year of what to do with this house. And I finally made the decision. So I'm putting it up on the market at the end of this month. You have to really dig deep with those type of decisions. Lauren, I have heard this term and you mentioned it. And I'd, I'd really love to hear, hi, Chiama. I'd really love to hear what this means. What is a poverty mindset How do you get out of that? Yeah. Um, So poverty mindset is like this mindset that you didn't have enough growing up 
And so when you grow up, you have this mindset that you're not going to have enough. So for example, I'll give you some examples of how this would play out in adulthood. Let's say you grew up without any shoes um, because you were very poor um, living in a third world country, let's say. And I, I actually know this. I know somebody who's like this. So uh, they grew up in a, in a, you know, a third world country. Uh, were very poor, had one pair of shoes that they had duct tape around it. And that was the only pair of shoes he had. Moves over to the United States um, and starts making money and cannot stop buying sneakers because there are never mm -hmm. enough sneakers to fulfill this need or urge inside of him that he needs sneakers and that somebody else will need sneakers sometimes. So he buys all the sneakers on clearance for a couple of years. Um, so that's how it could play out in one hand. Another hand is you grew up really poor. And then when you are making money, you always have in your head that you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. Um, you know, if I, if I, if I don't like save it, um, I'm going to lose it. So they put everything in savings and don't enjoy what they are making because they're afraid that it's not going to last because they're just not worth what they're making now. It's, it's a, you know, a flash in the pan. So, so that's kind of how it would play out in adulthood. Okay. How do we overcome this? Is this where you get a financial advisor? Is this where you would hire someone to help you through this? Yeah. Well, a financial advisor is not going to help you really so much with the mental stuff behind it. They're going to help you with the numbers. I think a financial mm. therapist Okay. And a financial advisor would work great together. A financial therapist is going to help you with those type of underlying things. A financial coach can help you with that as well. But a financial therapist, I think, um, you know, I have a background in drug and alcohol counseling. I was actually a chemical dependency uh, counselor for many years before I had kids. And um, so I do have a lot of like therapy experience. So I'm not a credential therapist, Um but I can see the benefit of being a financial therapist because you can dig deeper behind the poverty mentality stuff of like dealing with, no, this is not the way it is right now. Um, this is not, um, you know, this is not your current reality and dealing with those like old tapes that play in your head that mm -hmm. affect your current spending. Tim. <laughs> Hi, Lauren. I'm okay. going to step out. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to step out. This is yeah. my, my goodbye. Lauren, it has been so good to meet you. Tim's going to continue the conversation. I do have one last question. I'm going to listen in on my car as I am driving <laughs> north a little bit. And my question is, Lauren, I have to know this from you. I want to know your message to women who are trying to climb out of poverty or financial hardship in any capacity. Okay. Okay. Yep. I will answer that. I'll give you, I'll give you a couple minutes to get in the car. How about that? <laughs> All right. Thanks, Lauren. Bye, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Do you want yeah. me to answer that now, Tim, or what should, what should I do? Um, give well, a minute. <laughs> tell people about where they can find your podcast in the meantime. Yeah. Um, um, so people... give Christelle a bit of time to get into the car and then yeah, listen to your so... answer to before. <laughs> so people can find me at laurengroupman.com slash podcast. Yeah. Um, is where the podcast page is, I guess, where you can see show notes and stuff. But um, it's wherever podcasts are played. You know, you can find it on Apple, Apple and Google yeah. and, you Spotify. know, wherever yeah. wherever yeah. podcasts are played. So, um, but Now you can answer the question. <laughs> yeah, now I can answer. So in response to that question, um, I think that, you know, if people are trying to climb out of debt, the big thing – there's a there. I mean, it's kind of individual for a lot of different people, but I think that the big thing for for anybody that I have them do this exercise when I'm working with somebody is for them to write down. I have this worksheet, um, and I actually let me find my planner. Oh, here it is. So I don't I don't make these anymore, but I used to make this planner called the Personal Finance Planner. Um, you, you can actually, there's a digital copy of it on my website, really? but, yeah. um, when I, when in the very beginning of the planner, it says, what is my why? And at the bottom it says, why are you making a change? Who or what is the first thing you think about when you imagine yourself being financially free? 
So what I, the exercise that I have everybody do is, is write down their why. Why do they want to get out of debt? Why do they want a better financial future? Who do they envision themselves to be like when they're out of debt? What do they want to feel like? The feelings around that. That's the goal. So now when you set a budget, now when you set a goal for your finances, anytime you take out that credit card, I want you to visualize that you yourself are removing yourself from that goal. Mm -hmm. You're going backwards. So you have the power and the choice to go forward, right? You have the power and the choice to move the needle. And you also have the power and the choice to go backwards. So I just, I have people write that out. And, you know, if they, if they put it in their phone or they put it, you know, on their mirrors, um, put it in the forefront of their mind so that um, they can be successful with that. But that's their own personal vision. I can't make them. This is where they need to set that vision for themselves. Okay, I've got a bit of a weird question, but I like asking weird questions. So bring it. <laughs> um, what is your viewpoint on the way that society is changing? Because traditionally, when I when I grew up, it was you do what you do one or two or three or four jobs in a career, mm -hmm. and then you retire, and then you do all the enjoyment stuff when you retire. Now, I kind of did that for like eighteen, probably eighteen years or so, and then I gave up work and I started doing writing and other stuff and in effect I've kind of run a business and been semi-retired at the same time do you think that there's an element in the way society has changed in that people aren't going to do they're not just going to keep working and then retire they're going to kind of switch into different kind of lifestyle mm -hmm. um, businesses and uh, and to, to some degree, that is what financial freedom is. So what, what's your views on retirement and running your own business and lifestyle businesses and the world as a whole at the yeah. moment? <laughs> That's a great question. And uh, I agree with you that I feel semi-retired already. Yeah. You know, like I've run this business for 12 years and I'm a single mom and I I probably work 30 hours a week and I take summers off to spend yeah. time with my kids. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So I don't want to get to the end of my life and regret how I've spent it. Yeah. Um, I try and preach that to people. Like we don't know if retirement is guaranteed and all of the research has shown that people pass away very quickly after retirement, right? After they have that. So I think saving for retirement is a great idea. Right. I mean, that is very financially smart. But I also don't typically agree with the idea of putting my future in the hands of somebody else. Yeah. I think that some people are born and bred to be workers among workers with a job. And they will never be convinced to do the kind of lifestyle that we do. Right. Yeah. My ex-husband is one of them. He worked with me for a couple of years on the website. It was not his thing. And then he went, yeah. he's an actuary. He went back to work. He loves the corporate America lifestyle. Me, not so much. <clears throat> so I don't think, I think saving for retirement is a good thing. I think if you can find a way to live your life the way you want to live it while being able to provide a, you know, a life that you love, do it because it's like the best life ever. Yeah. You know, like, especially if you have kids, like for me, like I can work my life around my children. Doesn't mean it's easy all the time, but, um, it's a beautiful life. So I think it's just based on where you're at. Right. Um, I just know that I don't want to wait until retirement to live my happy years. You know what I mean? Like I can live those now. I see a lot more people doing it, but I also have my feelings about the fire movement. <coughs> Excuse me. If people aren't familiar with the fire movement. That's like work super hard, spend like no money mm. and make, you know, save millions and then like retire by your 40 and like don't work to me that also wastes 
many precious years of my life with my kids. Because if I do that, I'm not seeing my kids anyway, because I'm working so hard to put all this money away. So um, the fire movement is also something that I'm not really on board with. I kind of like the way my life is now. Well, your views on, on I'm running the Twitter chat on this later <laughs> on, so I'm Excuse a bit me. biased, but what they call it location independence and the whole digital nomad kind of. <laughs> so I'm sure if you move to say, well, I, I'll say Guatemala or something, you can live in Guatemala, like there's a big, nice lake there and you could live on like $300 a month or whatever. Um, obviously you wouldn't because you've got four kids, <laughs> but um, what are your views about like people who would argue like, yeah, maybe if you've got a job that you can do from anywhere, then maybe you should move out away from the U S or the UK into somewhere that's a bit cheaper if you can get a visa and the rest of it. Oh, I would do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I've actually talked to my kids about, you know what, after the house sells, like I have an RV. Yeah. Like maybe we'll travel this summer. Maybe, maybe I won't, maybe I'll put all my stuff in storage and we'll travel this summer. You know, I, I have no issues living in an RV for the summer. I mean, I have a boat and I have kayaks and I have a camper, so I could literally get a campground <laughs> on Lake Ontario and just live there for the summer. And I would be happy as a peach. Yeah. I mean, I really just don't care what people think about me anymore. Like in that sense that simplicity with like, oh, it would just be heaven for me to like not have to worry about stuff. You know what I mean? Like all this stuff in this huge house. And so we've talked about that, that we could we could travel and on the weeks that I have them go to different campgrounds and or just stay put in one and and live out of the camper at the out of the RV. It's big enough for all of us. So yeah. we might we might do that. And, and I'm cool with that, too. So, I mean, this is something I've noticed over the last five, ten years, because I was very much a corporate person, and that's kind of what I did. Um, but I was widowed, and then it's kind of like eventually I was like, well, I don't. The mortgage is paid off. I can do other things. But a lot the biggest barrier I find a lot of the time is your expectation of what other people will think of you. Mm -hmm. uh, how much of that is an issue when it comes to finance and because there's a lot of what they call here keeping up with the joneses so if the people right. next door have got like um, a really nice car mm -hmm. then you want might want to upgrade your one because you don't want the people next door to think that your car is worth how much is that an issue with finance it's huge it's huge, it's huge. Oh, i deal with that a lot with the people that i work with and i know that i love this saying and uh, if people listening can edge this into their mind. I used to care what other people thought about me until I tried to pay my bills with their opinions. Yeah. Yeah. That is a fantastic sign, <laughs> yes. isn't it? And it's so true. When I sold my house, my the house that I had built for me, it was in like a nice brand new neighborhood. We all built our houses the same time. I had an Audi and a Cadillac in the driveway. The Cadillac got repoed. We sold our house. Um, I mean, we were a mess, mm. you know? And why can't we say, and I'm just very open of like, we were a mess. And there's been times that I've been a mess. And it's like, I want to be able to say I was a mess then. What's the problem, you know? But <clears throat> I think that that that's a huge, it's a it's a huge issue is the keeping up with the Joneses and um and I think that if 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 you can just stay in your own lane and deal with your own stuff and and know that other people have their own issues and you can you can work on yours and be okay with being where you're at and knowing that you're making the right decisions for your family. You know, in social media, like maybe just, you know, if you're making some hard decisions, like just stay off of Facebook and Instagram mm. and, you know, just zone in on what your stuff is right now and stop playing the comparison game. I mean, that's something that I always encourage my clients to do as well. Yeah. Well, there's a, not meaning to be controversial, but there is a lot of stuff on social media. that's a little <laughs> bit fictional at times. About oh, it, it totally lives. is. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely, um, when I went through my divorce, I was at the top of my career. I mean, I'll just put this into perspective. 
I was at the top of my career. My ex-husband and I were working together. He was working on my, with me and my business and our marriage was falling apart. So mm. like, but everything looked fine on social media. Everything looked great. And I, you know, I've seen that on other social media accounts with other uh, people that, you know, married couples that work together. And it is hard. It's hard to be in the public spotlight. It's hard to manage everything that goes into that, but it's just what you see is like a highlight reel on social media of all the good stuff. Um, not the crying on the floor in the mm. middle of the night, you know, you don't see that. And when you put that up, people say, Oh, you're just looking for likes. It's like, no, like this is real, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, just, if you need to, get off Facebook and Instagram for a little while to focus on your stuff, do it. So I've heard this said before, and I'm not sure it's entirely true, but I think there's an element of this. Do you think that good couples are those that have similar financial kind of um, mindset, so to speak? Like if one person is massively spendthrift mm -hmm. and the other person saves a lot, could that work as a relationship or should they be two people who are both savers or both two people who are both mm -hmm. spenders? I think it can work in uh, every scenario as long as they're good communicators. Yeah. Um, I think that as long as they balance each other out in both ways, I think if you have two spenders that don't know how to communicate, you're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so as long as they can communicate, I think that any, any relationship will work. And on the flip side, if they don't communicate at all, none of them are going to work. And so, you know, when it comes to couples and money, again, much deeper conversation than just money. Number one thing that couples fight about is money, but it's not really about money. Mm. It really goes a lot deeper than that. Okay. Well, we've done the half hour. We, I think I could probably keep talking to you for sort of days, <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, I've got places to see outside in the amazing yes. uh, city that is Charlotte. Yeah. Uh, if the light comes back again, um, so let's recap. How can people like find out find out about you, what you do, your podcast, and uh, how can they find you on television? Because I know you're on television today. Yeah. So, um, they can find me, um, on the doctor's television show today. Uh, they can go to on Instagram. It's like at the doctor's TV oh. and check out the local listings. That's a national show. Um, I also just taped a segment with Rachel Ray last week. So that should be airing next week. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they can go to Lauren .com, and Grootman is G R E U T M A N. And my, my podcast is called the hard money talks show. Or you can just type in Hard Money Talks in your favorite podcast player um, in all of the podcast players. So you can check that out. Um, yeah. So and I'm in social media. You can find me at Lauren Grootman on Instagram, you know, Twitter, Facebook, um, all of that. So you can check it out there. Okay. Well, thanks for being on the show today. Yes. Lauren. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in San Diego in the week. Yes. Social media marketing world. <laughs> So yep. thanks to everybody for watching. Thank you. Bye. This is um, Erevan. Mm -hmm. I've made more money in the last three years than I did in the previous uh, seven. It's a shit, you know.